So I'm just gonna say what we all already know. Saru and the Navari president are totally pawn paring back there. We all know it. We see it. We know. We know. Let's do this thing, cause it's time to review another Star Trek Discovery. Season 4, episode 4, all is possible. Like apparently, Jesse singing, I don't know why, this is why I'm introing, but we're gonna do a non-spoiler section up front, then get into spoilers. I had it. I had it right up until the end there, but then I totally lost it. <laughs> I guess not all is possible. But regardless, yes, like I said, I'm going to be reviewing the fourth episode of the series. We're going to talk non-spoilers up front, then there'll be an ad break before we get into it. So if you haven't seen the episode yet, you'll know when to jump off. But stick around for the ad because it does help pay my bills. Anyways, getting into my non-spoiler review, I really enjoyed this episode quite a bit. There's basically two major plots going on here. The first plot is kind of a standard people stranded on an ice planet having to come together and overcome their, you know, preconceptions about each other, working together, Starfleet Academy kind of thing. This is a fairly typical story just in general but especially for Star Trek I mean it goes all the way back to the original series with one of the first episodes of Star Trek ever Galileo 7 where we just had the crew stranded on a planet Spock's trying to handle everybody but obviously not getting it all perfectly basically every Star Trek series has one of these episodes at some point and this episode didn't really add too much to the mix in terms of the story being told but I think it worked well for Tilly's arc that's been going on this entire season and also sort of fleshed out a little bit of where we're at in terms of like Starfleet Academy and cadets and how they view each other and how this new era of Starfleet is not entirely gelling but starting to come together and reflect the Starfleet of old that we came to know back in the 23rd and 24th century. So ultimately this storyline wasn't revelatory. It didn't break the mold in any shocking or dis like distinct way but it was a solidly done tale and I enjoyed it for what it was even though I knew all the beats going into it. However it was the second story of the episode that really I deeply deeply enjoyed because it's the thing that I really always love when Star Trek does and does well and I think only Deep Space Nine and TNG a little bit here and there and actually Enterprise you know what and a few, a few everyone besides Voyager really kind of did this sort of thing well and that was delving into the inner politics of the Federation. I really love when we get to see a Star Trek series just sit down and hammer up politics between alien governments in a way that's somewhat reflective of our own world but in a much more idealistic way and I thought that this episode just did these politics really really well it was able to balance a something that often gets forgotten in a lot of like older Star Trek the difference between Starfleet the Federation and then Federation members and seeing those distinctions between each group this in this case the Starfleet Federation and Navarre who is trying to negotiate enter into the Federation and I liked the understanding that this episode brought that each faction not only has their own distinct point of view but also has their own internal politics within them because Navarre is also a sort of divided split planet as well as we've seen with Romulans and Vulcans. The Federation is made up of a bunch of different people. Starfleet doesn't always agree. And I just loved that this episode finally gave breadth to that nuance that it wasn't just like these sides all have their own ideas but it was also inside of those ideas they have their own stuff. And I thought that that was all really well done but then also handled perfectly and meshed perfectly with the other minor arcs that we've been having going on with our characters, namely between Burnham and the Federation president, also Saru and the Navari president as well. And we, like I said, we totally know they're boning. It, we can, the sexual tension, the sexual tension between those two, in a way that you could have sexual tension between a Kelpian and a Vulcan, uh, it's very palpable. Let's just say. And it's definitely building off of their relationship that we saw and fans reacted to way back in season three. And so overall, I thought that that politics story was truly excellent and some of the most nuanced politics stories I've seen done since Deep Space Nine on a Star Trek show. And then also there's the C-plot between Book and Culber that I've also really enjoyed this episode with getting a chance to see Culber have his time to shine as a counselor, which we've seen him doing it in sort of like middle of situations, but we've never seen him acting as like a sit down and talk to people counselor in a way that counselor to do and so it was nice to see that side of him as well in this episode so between all of these storylines while one was sort of more standard it did flesh out this element and time period in the Star Trek universe and then we have a really great politics story on the other hand I think this averages out to be a really great um, episode of Star Trek Discovery that uh, 
I just heavily, heavily enjoyed and is honestly probably my favorite episode of the season so far. But that is all my thoughts for the spoiler-free review. So we're going to get full into the recap and spoilers of the episode. So if you have not seen the episode yet, you can hop off here. There'll be a quick little ad break and then we'll jump into spoilers. However, before we get much further, it's time to quick talk about my sponsor for the rest of my Star Trek reviews this year, The Geek Fight. The Geek Fight is a nonprofit online store that fights for a diverse future. And they have two goals. Number one, create an easy way to learn about human rights thanks to their library, a digital library with light content. Over there you can find the stories of people fighting for human rights like the amazing Marsha P. Johnson, learn about how we can abolish and rethink policing, and find movies that represent disabilities beyond stereotypes, and even more. And number two, they hope to raise money for social causes. They have t-shirts, pillows, prints, etc. with human rights and geek designs, combining the best of both worlds. For example, I have this adorable bag which has this wonderful little trans badger on it. It's absolutely adorable. And uh, all the money for things like this go to organizations like the Human Rights Campaign, which is an LGBTQ organization fighting for LGBTQ rights. So please go check out The Geek Fight. It's a wonderful place. You get to get yourself cool knowledge and cool nerdy stuff and also support really cool stuff doing really great work. So please go check out The Geek Fight. And if you want 15% off all of your orders, use the promo code JESSE at checkout to get yourself that, you know, 15% off that I just mentioned. So thank you so much to The Geek Fight and let's get back to the review. All right, now let's get into spoilers, everyone. I'm excited to talk about this. Uh, how I'm going to sort of split up this recap is there are three major storylines here, but I'm going to talk about the intro of this episode first because there were kind of their own little separate scenes there first. And then I'll get into the three distinct storylines that we have wrapping out. So to intro the episode, we got a captain's log where we learn that Burnham has mandated that everyone take some shore leave. We also learn that Stemets is overworking himself, sort of putting the weight of the world on his shoulders to try and solve the anomaly threat, sort of checking in with all those moments. We also get a return to the new Star Trek Discovery bar, which again, that bar is sexy AF. I love it. I want to be in it. I want to go to there so badly. And also it's worth mentioning. It is so worth mentioning in this recap here that apparently Tilly has an NX-01 snow globe, um, and I want it. I want it right now. I did not know that an NX-01 snow globe was a thing. Uh, I have my NX-01 literally hiding right off camera as I hit the mic right here. I want that snow globe. I, I'm the biggest Enterprise fan. Give it to me. That better be on the Star Trek store right now or else uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to riot. Have I beat this bit into the ground yet? Because I just want you to know I want an NX-01 snow globe. You don't tease me with that sort of thing, Star Trek. You don't tease me with that. Then we have a quick little scene with Tilly and Culber. As I mentioned in my intro, I really like seeing Culber in the counselor chair and getting to talk with Tilly and sort of have his time to shine. And he convinces her to, again, she's been wanting to break out of her comfort zone. So she is encouraged to go hang out with cadets at Starfleet Academy and have it be her off hours, which I feel like having your off hours be like going and teaching at the Academy is like, I'm a workaholic and I'm like, oh man, just take some time for yourself, Tilly. It doesn't always have to be busy work, but I understand what they're getting at here. It makes sense to me. And then we also get a quick little scene between Gray and Adira. I love the chemistry between these two. I think they are absolutely wonderful together. Gray's outfit, by the way, top notch. I mean, I, I should know that like Ian Alexander will be wearing top notch outfits considering like what he actually wears in real life. His outfit was just magnificent. Magnif I was going to say magnificent and magnifique at the same time and it came out magnificent. So there you go. But I just really like the relationship between these two characters. I think that their chemistry is just wonderful. And again, as I mentioned last episode, it's just really, it still moves me to see a non-binary character and a trans character just getting to share their love with each other on a Star Trek show. I don't think that's ever going to get old to me, to be honest. It just, it's just cool to see. And it means a lot. And I know I'm beating a dead horse when I say that over and over again in the episode, but it, it does. It means a lot to see that every episode because... You don't see that really anywhere else. And I'm just so glad that Star Trek of all things is the show to give us that. Okay, after this point is where we split into our three distinct storylines for the episode. So let's start with the sort of simplest one and shortest one, which was Book and Culber. And Culber giving a counseling session to Book. As I mentioned a couple times already, I just liked seeing Culber being a competent counselor and just getting to show these moments. It brings me back to the moments with Deanna Troy. And I always liked those scenes with Troy on TNG that when we got to see them, but she didn't get enough of them. So I really hope that this becomes a recurring bit with Culber because I just, I think Wilson Cruz gives such warmth to those scenes. And I just like these chances to get a little bit inside the psychology of our characters, especially in a show like Star Trek Discovery that is so defined by trauma. They definitely need to have more counselor sessions on the show. And I also liked book storyline here. I mentioned last episode that I was getting a little bit frustrated with book being defined by like I'm mopey because my planet's dead and I, I again I get that and I, I I just don't want his character to be just this mopey guy the entire season but it also makes sense to me in a show that again is so 
so defined by trauma that they're showing that it's not a straight line to recovery. Last episode, it would have been really easy to just say like, oh, he had the mind meld, he's all fixed, his trauma's gone. But this episode just shows that it's not a full like, you know, building off and just you're fine. It, there's backslides and things like that and it, it's moments like that and I think that they're handling it supremely well and honestly watching this I'm starting to get an understanding a little bit more of what this show is trying to go for with book storyline because again this is a show that is defined by trauma and I think that this storyline with book this season I think is trying to show an actual healthy way to handle trauma and pain and grief um, because Star Trek, because of its heightened action adventure type of way of doing things, especially in Discovery, hasn't always handled that in the healthiest of ways. And so I think showing a pathway to that on the show is doing what Star Trek always does best, which is reflect how we in our daily lives should handle these things. And I think that bringing it down to a small scale and a handleable scale with Book here in these scenes, I thought was really wonderful. And I like this sort of uh, therapy of him building the mandala, which is something that is someone who myself goes through therapy. I always like having like things to do while I'm playing like doing therapy like writing something drawing something it helps bring my mind into focus about what I need to talk about and I just liked that sort of showcasing of that technique here I also liked Culber bring in his culture and uh, his like standing funerals a uh, bit which was a bit gruesome but I see I know the practice is a real thing and honestly in, in, in its own kind of morbid way it is kind of cool and beautiful and I thought the story again very dark but also funny and I liked that it was used uh, in a really nice way here. So ultimately that whole storyline was great even though it was sort of like the more back burner C storyline of the episode. But getting into the bigger focuses of the episode we also have Tilly going off to teach the Starfleet Academy cadets. Again as I said in the spoiler free section this was a fairly typical like storyline that didn't really shock me. A few things to note with it though that I want to just touch upon that I think added a little bit of interesting flavor to it was first off we have Kovach, the David Cronenberg returning for the episode of course which is always nice to see him. Though it was a kind of a little bit saddening to me because his character to seem to have this air of mystery about him last season that I was super invested in. Like, was he Section 31? Was he Future Guy from Star Trek Enterprise? I know that that was me whining perhaps a little bit too much and reading a little bit too much into his character, but there was that sense of, like, air of mystique about him that this episode seemed to be strip away and he's just sort of like a normal dude that hangs out on you know in Starfleet and just an intelligence officer and so I, I'm kind of saddened by that because I was hoping a little bit more for him and maybe that'll still come back around but here he just seemed more like a just a normal guy making an appearance so I was a little bit disappointed by that however going off on the mission uh, of course they all these cadets are sort of arguing with each other they haven't really had a chance to like Federation times prior uh, actually interact with other races and species and that really started to come out and I think a little bit of it, of it felt a tiny bit forced to me but that also might just be because I'm used to Starfleet members always working cohesively and I have to remember that these are cadets and that the time period and the time after the burn and so putting that filter on it I think it read a little bit more realistic and I felt that I enjoyed it more as the episode got more into it because initially I just thought like come on these this feels a little bit over the top but when we start to learn the reasons for the cadets I actually appreciated that more like we have the Tellarite looking guy who very much had an issue with the Orion because he grew up in the Emerald Chain and Orions were running that. And I was a bit worried that they were getting a bit repetitious of Tendi's character over in Star Trek Lower Decks, hence why I'm wearing the Tendi outfit for this review, because the Orion guy kind of also says, like, I have to work twice as hard. I have to, you know, work really, really hard to get seen and I'm top of my class, which is sort of the same exact thing that Tendi said back in Lower Decks Season 2 just, you know, a few months ago. I don't get to make mistakes like you do. It was hard getting into the Academy. There's still a lot of stigma around Orions. A lot of humans think we're all thieves. And I was like, oh, that's a little bit repetitious. But I liked that they gave it a little bit of its own unique flavor for the character when he revealed that his father, they said, was actually one of the ones working to try to reform the Emerald Chain and became a political prisoner as a result of that. And so he harbors this sort of trauma as well in his backstory that actually enables them to connect. And I like that Tilly was able to draw that out of him. And I thought that that was uh, sort of a nice bit for for those characters and add a little bit of flavor and a, that sort of Star Trekian theme of coming together on mutual ground in a very, very nice way. But beyond that, the rest of the storyline felt a little bit cliche. Again, it was like Tilly getting to show her leadership skills, bringing people together, and that was sort of setting off her arc. As we see at the end of the episode, she decides to leave Discovery, which was a big deal for her character. Um, I'm interested to see how they're going to develop that. I don't think she's going to be leaving the show. We've seen characters leave Discovery, you know, t here and there um, over the seasons before. So it'd be interesting to see like what they do with her character sort of running Starfleet Academy and probably 
probably bouncing off of Dana, David Cronenberg's character as well. So I'm curious to see how that aspect of her is going to be developed, and it's an interesting path for her character. And I love the final moments between Burnham and Tilly here as well that was just, they felt very human with them, like, joking back and forth about being roommates together. And I was I was laughing, and I just love their, again, this friendship between these two characters has been one of the most, like, heartwarming and real aspects of this show. And I like these moments of just, like, them talking about that and just hugging each other and caring about each other and just worrying about each other. It's been so nice to see, and you really feel the warmth between these two actors on screen during those moments. I also like the idea that you can quiet snoring on uh, Federation ships, like, like silence it, like have a noise canceling like Sheen. I wish we had that in real life. It would help me out a lot, but I, I just like that idea. I think that's really, really cool. And then the other things about the storyline I just want to mention was apparently the planet that they landed on was the same moon from Star Trek 2009. I know it wasn't really, but it just evoked that sense, like these creatures coming up from the ground. <laughs> And the ice planet of it all and then they all want to go hide in a cave and i'm just sitting here thinking are they gonna find spock in that cave is that is that what that orion's asking for you want to go find leonard newmore just hanging out with a torch in a cave and chris pine i am spock bullshit that that's all i could think about that entire section was apparently it's the same moon around of, especially since we're at vulcan in the other storyline here it was just sort of um I just made me laugh and think of that quite quite heavily. Oh, Jesse from the future here because I forgot to mention that there was a wonderful reference in the cadet sequence that I loved where the cadets asked Tilly, he's like, is this all a simulation? Is this not real? Are we in like a holodeck or something? Which read to me like a reference to the really awful and very ethically dubious numerous Starfleet tests that we've seen over the years like Wesley Crusher having to like save his friend's life and thought he was gonna die in that one episode of like Star Trek The Next Generation Season 2 as his Starfleet entrance exam or like the Kobayashi Maru in general, or like the Pike thing that we saw in Short Treks a few years ago. Uh, just Starfleet loves its horrible, unethical uh, cadet training programs, and this one definitely could have like filled that bill. So I liked the little reference with the cats were like, this is just a hollow deck, and until he's like, no, he's dead, he dead, he really dead. So I like that they acknowledged that, that as that is a thing. I thought that was hilariously funny. I also should say, I didn't particularly love Adira's storyline here. They felt a little bit too like, forced like trying to be like i don't need to prove myself i'm already an ensign it, i get that they're young but i i don't know it, it, it again it was a little bit more forced conflict than i particularly prefer so that aspect of it i didn't particularly love either but overall this storyline fairly standard but i like the little like shades of uniqueness that this storyline gave us but this brings me to the final storyline of the episode the part of the episode that i just absolutely adored which again as i talked about in spoiler free section politics Give me more alien Star Trekian Federation politics. I want it all the time because it's, I always love it so, so juicy. I mean, it was my favorite part of Deep Space Nine, Enterprise as well in, in season four. Uh, and even last season in um, the second to last episode of Discovery, we had those like negotiation scenes between the Emerald Chain and Vance that I also really enjoyed and were a highlight of that season for me. So this whole sequence was absolutely wonderful. And we learn in the negotiations for Navarre trying to join the Federation that Navarre is asking for a get out of jail free card essentially being able to leave the federation whenever they want to as part of the signing of the contract which the president of the federation makes very clear would result in a weaker federation because other people would want the same clause it would also mean that you know the federation would burden all the risk she makes an excellent point and again i like that the federation president in this season is very much played as a politician and not always right and definitely willing to play politics, but not an incompetent politician and not a bad person. So often in Star Trek, we have the obstinate bureaucrat type character or the obstinate admiral type character who are just there to obstruct our characters. And I like that the Federation president is often at odds with Burnham this season so far, but in ways that make sense and in ways that are smart for her character as a politician and ones that I can understand her point of view. I think that that is just really good and depthful writing on the writer's part for her character and it's just really making me intrigued by every chance that we get to see more of this federation president but ultimately learn that there is some sort of political theater going on here and that saru and burnham were not asked to come to this conference just you know because but because there might have been some um desire by the navari president which by the way her name's turin i keep forgetting to say that i just say navari president but turin and also the federation president to sort of get them to do some some backdoor dealing as it were and i enjoyed these scenes especially the scenes with saru and turin again as i joked about at the top of this we all know that there is there is some sex appeal between that kelpian and turin i i really like seeing these two and i'm i'm joking like 
yes, there's sexual tension before, between them. We know that they're 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 pawn firing it up. But seriously, I think that there's actually a really good emotional connection between these two characters, and it's an unconventional romance, but one that I'm really excited to see develop, and I really am glad that the writers are leaning into it. I thought that that was just entirely sweet, especially Tarin like giving uh, Kim his Kelpian tea was just like, oh, she notices the small details. They're so cute together. But then also we learn that uh, we that there is a division within Navarre, the Vulcan purists, that don't really wish to join the Federation, and so this get out of jail free clause was an element of them um, asking for it. I really loved this because again, it shows that while we have Federation Vulcan Starfleet is three different aspects in these negotiations, even within them, they have their own factions that don't always agree. And so I just like seeing this like different shades and sides of politics and it made sense and I just liked seeing that. And I thought that that was just awesome and just so nuanced in a way that Star Trek rarely does. Normally Star Trek's just sort of like, we're one people and we all agree on this one thing. We have one monoculture and that's it. And I, I just enjoyed seeing that, that shades there as well as um, Burnham sort of acknowledging the same thing about the Federation president that, you know, she, the Federation president can't really compromise because she's a leader of the Federation and there are many people behind her. She just represents everyone. And so she can't appear as giving in to the um, Navari demands because she's uh, the president and she has to back up all these people. And so I like that Starfleet was able to offer up the third solution. And Burnham came up with this idea of creating a committee that could basically audit uh, Federation world and the Federation is making sure that everything works together. And I thought that that was just a really cool idea. I also did like the small acknowledgement here by Tarin that it is awkward that there's a civilian negotiation going on here and Starfleet's there. And I like this acknowledgement that Starfleet is, while it is more focused on science, a military. And that's a little bit problematic in a civilian negotiation. And so I thought that, that was a cool acknowledgement. It is a little bit of lampshading because I don't do anything about it, but I do at least like that acknowledgement of the the problem of Starfleet inherently being a military in civilian negotiations. Um, that's not something you would ever really see in any Star Trek show. So I thought that was even the acknowledgement was cool. And then to wrap up the storyline, I all just really liked the idea that Turin was actually the one that let it slip to the Federation president that this sort of surprise was going to be brought up and that's why Burnham was brought in but the Federation president didn't entirely trust Burnham to be the one to do it and again this growing trust that they're building between the president and Burnham I think is definitely just sort of the arc of this season that these two are going to come to loggerheads at a few times and also build trust between them and I just like that that Star Trekian sort of building trust between characters arc that we have going on here and also it should be mentioned that Saru and Tarin leave to go have tea mm-hmm tea but one quick little thing before we wrap out this review is in that one shot of the Federation slash Starfleet headquarters that we get after Tilly comes back from the cadets, there's a ship that goes by the screen really briefly, just a flyby, and it looked like the Puddle Jumper from Stargate Atlantis. And I was like, is that the Puddle Jumper? And unfortunately I couldn't, because CBS doesn't let me take screenshots on their app, which is annoying as all hell. So I couldn't get a good picture of it, but go back and watch that. It's sort of the end of the episode. Pause it. It straight up looked like the Puddle Jumper from Stargate Atlantis. Uh, should be a picture of it right up here, of the Stargate Atlantis one at least. And it just made me think of that. And I'm like, oh, nice little Easter egg if, that's, if that was the intention there. But regardless of my way too niche nerddoms noticing things in quick little flybys, that is my review for this episode. Overall, I think this is a really great episode. While one storyline didn't like break the mold, I think all of it was excellently told. And one storyline for me just, I think, knocked it out of the park with everything that I've always wanted from Star Trek in politics. And I thought did a truly excellent job. Um, this was by far, I think, just talking it out, my favorite episode of the season so far, and maybe one of my favorite episodes of Discovery as a whole, even though it was much more lower key in general. Um, but that's part of why I'm liking this season so far, is that it's not super action-oriented, but it is a much lower key season, and about the politics, and about the interaction between characters. And I think if this season continues to keep going this way, this might be my favorite season of Star Trek Discovery so far. We're only four episodes in, but... It's been impressing me, other than last episode, which was a little bit of a stumble. Um, I've just been deeply enjoying this season. So I'd love to hear all your thoughts, though, down in the comments. Have you been enjoying this season? Did you love this episode? Are you as involved in the Federation politics as I am? Are you also wanting to see... Nope, you don't want to see that. I don't want to see... Nope, nope, not going to mention that. I was going to say, do you want to see this Saru and Tarin have sex? But I, I meant that more in like a as a, like a back way like you're not actually watching them but i know it came across weird i'm gonna stop talking now subscribe like and patreon helps me pay the bills so there you go have a good night live long and prosper everyone